thank you. Like the same. So tell me about what you're writing now. I'm working on a very far out piece. Um, so are you I, planning on recording it? Oh, I'll record it myself. But you know, um, what I wanted to do was do it live. And, and I came down to Florida and we still have New York. I came down last time thinking that I was gonna have some performances because there are five orchestras here in Sarasota. But then COVID hit and nobody's playing. Right. I would assume your ability to record anything of your own is pretty good because you are a synthesizer person. You were digital before digital was everything. It was pretty hairy in the 80s, I can tell you. Um, in the 70s, we used to laugh at synthesizers. They were a waste of time. How are you recording your music now? Like Logic? No, I mean, I'm just using Sibelius to notate legit stuff. I like that, you yes. know. Uh, they have terrible sounds, you know, the reference I sounds. Know. That's like in the Salvation Army sound bank. It's yeah. really, it's so awful. I mean, coming from you, you have the best technology of synthesizer equipment and programming equipment. It's gotta be tough. When I started um, getting my own stuff, it, Atari was running the market. Mac was, you know, in charge yet. My first Atari was two megs. Yeah. Right? And I got a call from Manny's Music, um, and they said, Ann, you got to get down here. The new Ataris are out. And he said, four megs. You are never going to need more power. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, there's a whole Atari religion, you know, that did, nobody lets go of their Ataris. I have mine. I did the, some of the hippest music on that. I mean, I did like really funky shuffles on it. Well, I worked in 12-8, you know, and I figured out the way to accent and delay and all that so that um, it cooks, you know. You know, it's, it's easier for me to write things down. And I always was very happy that I wasn't a player because I, I never wrote it an instrument. I write it at a table. I write what's in my mind and I write it down. So when you initially wrote it out, it was just like an instinct and you would let it go, write the arrangement for everybody else. But your original idea for the composition was quick. The quickest one I ever wrote is the Transformers theme. The messenger came up, the bike messenger came and gave me this envelope. I opened it up and I looked at the script. I heard it, I went to the desk and I wrote it down and I went to the piano and played it. Do you think that the composition of My Little Pony was more of an or orchestral uh, classical arrangement? Yeah, well, those were orchestral pieces. I mean, orchestra orchestration is a classical art. To write for Gem, it's more of an 80s rock kind of thing more yeah, than more than my little pony less classical my much more like you know magical disney kind of type of thing, orchestration jam was fun because there were three bands and they had to each have a different sound you know so jam was pop she had horns she was like a pop singer um more more standard pop with horns and rhythm and everything and then we sweetened with synthesizers which were <laughs> always a big well, maybe this is going to work today. Now, Pizzazz, the bed girl, was electronica. And the only live instrument I think that we ever had for her tracks was we once or twice had some solos. And then there was the stingers. They were like an egocentric, you know, egotist. And they were very smooth and cool and kind of sexy and funky. Right. And um, I had a different sound for them. And they were um, electronic in a different way they were kind of they were like a, they were a combination yeah it sound it sounds current though so did you listen to any particular groups at the time to get a feel for what that sound was yeah not as a composer though i i never listened to people's music I've, i i had to write too much music to be listening to other music and i had music going at every minute i couldn't even cross the street it was a problem my ear was there with the the sound of the day, you walk in a restaurant, you walk, you know, you, you, you go into a party, you hear all that stuff. I don't know, I don't find it that hard to shift because I take in the information, I never take notes. They give me certain stuff, you know, we want this to be for teenagers, okay? And then I look at the way the lyrics are and I look at the storyboards and I go, got it, and then put it aside and forget about it. And then when I'm alone, I go, what does this song wanna be? And there it is. They're really complicated arrangements, like as far as being a musician's dream, if I were to listen to a gem arrangement, it's like, you know, musically, that's what I listen for. As far as a client, did you get any kind of criti criticism that it was 
not simple in comparison to what's on the market? No, they didn't have any problem with that. At one point, there was this call with Joe Bacall, who owned the ad agency and was creative director. And he and uh, I got pulled into this conference call. And Ford said, uh, Joe thinks that some of the arrangements are starting to sound alike for the Misfits, whatever. And I said, well, listen, they're all, we have one minute, the same singer, the same tempo, the song lyrics are too long. I mean, they're all going to be the same tempo, the same key, the same singer, and they're all going to start to sound the same. I mean, I can pull rabbits out of hats, but I'm running out of hats, you know. Um, give us more time. And the show was a hit. So he gave us a minute 20. And I said, I have another idea. Let me do intros. Really let me do intros. It could be 10 seconds, whatever. That'll take away from your cost on the background music. It'll lead up to the song and get the singer, the, the listener ready for the song. He liked that a lot, it saved a lot of money, but it allowed me to make the song a more full piece. And another thing that's been said uh, about the arrangements, because you say like they are complex, there were a lot of modulations in the gym songs. I told her personally, I said, you know, I did those modulations. I had a minute 20. Now you can state a whole song there, but trying to build it, you don't get to build it in the same way. You have to do something that's gonna make it take off like a rocket. And very often the thing in the, in the chorus at the end, you get two chorus repeats, modulate for the second one. And the song is just gonna go whoop like that because you need to do that. Yeah, it was a, it, it, I used a lot of classical techniques to make that stuff work, you know? I mean, the sound on some of these recordings hard to replicate you could tell they were done in a really fancy expensive studio penny lane was a nice studio it was really nice we had to layer things you know um it wasn't a big room like clinton or edison or... you started with judy when you were 16 how big was the band back then judy garland yeah she always had a pretty big orchestra but i wasn't her orchestra i was her musical scribe assistant no, they were they were like regular orchestras, usually 50, 60 pieces. That's a lot. Uh, no, but, but with Judy, when I worked on, on some music things that she was doing, she was doing the, the Johnny Carson show. Mm -hmm. And they have a band, you know, and I think it was Skitch Henderson was in charge of that. And, and, and she had arrangements for that already. Right. I didn't, I wrote things down for her. So I, I did. I said did some record copies, but I mostly wrote some things down. But I promise you, I'd tell you some good stories. You know, Judy Garland was. I was seventeen, and she was funny, very highly intelligent, gifted lady, and very kind, kind-hearted, big-hearted person, and laughed. She had the best laugh. And with all that was going on, and I think that this movie missed a lot. It, 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 it for anybody who's like your age, you saw her in Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, and you see this where this film is, this old drunk. Yeah. And Judy didn't, but she was addicted to prescription medications, and they had her regulated till this Mickey Dean's husband came along and started like exposing her to a lot of other things. But uh, Judy was quite wonderful, and she was very generous. I was playing something, I think it was a Jerome Kern song. And I said, what makes a hit song, Judy? What is, what is a hit song? And I said, is it the, the music or the lyrics, or the harmony, or the you know, melody? He said, it's all of that. It's when all of that comes from the same great place. Like it was there, it was all it was intended to be. And, and it's the mood that it creates. It's so perfect. It's inevitable. And in some way, everybody knows it when they hear it. And then the third story she told me, which helped me tremendously in a competitive market. We were backstage, oh yeah, with the palace. They had a big orchestra there. She had a one night that she was doing and she's over in the corner by the, there's several curtains, you know. And she's peeling back the curtains and looking out at the orchestra, uh, at the audience. And I was backstage and she said, Annie, come here, I'm gonna show you something. So I came over. She said, look, and she peeled it back and there were all these people. I mean, 2000 people. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a kid, you know, and, were, and she said, aren't they beautiful? I mean, they were all dressed up, you know. And I said, how are you gonna 
reach all those people. And she said, well, I don't have to reach all those people. I just have to reach one. And she said, you know, I got to please myself first. That's my job. That's your job. Please yourself first. And if you please, someone else will feel it too. And if you please one person, you've done something. And boy, did that take pressure off. I mean, everybody doesn't have to love what you do, but you do. <laughs> you have to love That's it. true.